In this video, I'm going to talk about what FND is, back to the basic, how it's usually diagnosed, what kind of treatment options are out there for you and your teens, and the prognosis of FND specifically for teens. So let's dive in. Hi, I'm Dr. Lee. I'm a pediatric health psychologist and founder of Teen FND Academy, an innovative online group coaching program that has helped a lot of teens and their parents got their lives back by resolving FND. So in today's video, I'm going to go back to the basics and then talk about what FND is and all kinds of things that you need to know to get that journey of healing started. So if you're watching this video, I can only imagine that you're probably a parent of a teenage child who just got diagnosed with FND or has been diagnosed with FND, but not quite sure exactly what it is. So you are scrambling for the information and then maybe you land it to my YouTube channel. If so, welcome, and I'm so glad you're here. And that really tells me that you're a dedicated parent who wants to help your child get better. So let's dive in. But just like so many families I have worked with, you probably haven't even heard of the word or diagnosis of FND until your child got diagnosed with one. So it's not your fault, and it's a really common diagnosis, but not a lot of people know about it. So let me walk you through the basics of FND so you know what you're dealing with. In this video, I'm going to have three different parts. First of all, what is FND, how it's diagnosed, and who diagnoses a condition? And then who treats FND? What kind of options are out there for you? And then what is the prognosis? That means, is your child going to get better from this, or is this sort of like a permanent thing that your child has to live with? So let me walk you through one by one, okay? Number one, what is FND? I'm so glad you asked. Functional neuroscopic disorder, short for FND, is an umbrella term to describe this cross-wired problems between the brain and the body. Even though your child's brain and body are structurally and physically quote-unquote okay, your child has probably gone through so many different tests like CT scan, EEG, MRI, X-ray, blood work, so many other neurological tests and things like that. But for the most part, the doctors cannot find anything on the scan or test or whatever they're doing, except a few things. So this is where it gets a little bit confusing and meaning some doctors are saying, well, well, we don't really see anything. That means you're fine or something like that. Very dismissive, right? It is a very, very common diagnosis in neurology and for whatever reasons, I mean, so many different reasons, since the pandemic in 2020, the rate and number of teens being diagnosed with FND has skyrocketed, like out of control. So it's not that they're suddenly coming out of the cave or anything like that, but there are so many different reasons which I'm getting into it. And speaking of... There is a difference between teen FND and adult FND. So step one, let me walk you through how the diagnosis of FND is given. Before I get to that, you should know what kind of symptoms are out there within this umbrella of FND. So I'm going to give you some categories of it. One is that the most common symptom is the functional seizures. So it could be looking like absent seizures or convulsive tonic-clonic seizures, and basically looking like epilepsy, but not quite. So these are categorically called functional seizures. And that also includes fainting, kind of convulsing, or dissociation. And different name for this functional seizures is non-epileptic seizures, NES, or psychogenic non-epileptic seizures, PNES. It used to be called pseudo-seizures or some other hysteria and things like that, but I'm not going to get into like old, super, super old history. But anyway, those are the different names to describe this one thing of functional seizures. And then there is weakness or paralysis or loss of sensations or visual loss. So kind of like this uh, sensation sensory area. And then there is the third category of movement. This could be tremors, jerks, ticks, twitches, difficulty of walking, like there's off balance. Drop attacks where people will just fall suddenly and muscle spasms. Then there's the cognitive symptoms. So brain fog, uh, attention span issues, memory issues, and things like that. 
And then there's a speech and swallowing, whether it's a talking or swallowing issues, and then functional dizziness. So they're not necessarily fainting or dr having drop attacks, but they're constantly feeling dizzy or suddenly feeling dizzy as if they are going to faint or fall. Then there are bladder symptoms. Uh, and then GI, so nausea, vomiting, IBS symptoms, and things like that. So those are giant, I guess, different categories that goes within the FND. Your child might be having only one or two symptoms of those. And the thing about FND is, is sort of like a come and go. So maybe today or up until today, your child is only having functional seizures. Now it's functional seizures plus weakness, plus fainting, plus movement, plus cognitive, you know, and then six months down the road, oh, everything else is great, but now there is bladder symptoms and now she's vomiting nonstop. Now there is a pain, you know, stuff like that. So related to that, what else goes together with FND? They are very tightly related and it could be part of FND or something that was happening before and or after FND started happening. The biggest, biggest thing is the chronic pain. So whether it's a complex regional pain syndrome, headaches, migraines, back pain, calf pain, arm pain, neck pain, shoulder pain, whatever the pain that you can imagine. And then there's a lot of fatigue. I hear from so many teens that they are constantly tired, you know, so the fatigue, feeling tired. And also sleep is disturbed, you know, so either having a hard time falling asleep or staying asleep or waking up or having difficulty staying awake during the day. And then there's some anxiety, depression, mostly related to FND here I'm talking about specifically and other health conditions that can go together like POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, EDS, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or hypermobility spectrum disorder, ADHD, autism, learning disability, low vitamin level D and B12 and all the other things, low iron level or ferritin level, thyroid issues or other inflammation, whether it's an acute or chronic viral infection, whether it's a COVID or um, EBV virus or any other things. So they kind of go together. Lyme disease, again, autoimmune disease, they're sort of related with FND as well. They're not the same thing, but they kind of go hand in hand. And generally speaking, diagnosis is given ideally by a neurologist because it's a functional neurological disorder. So it's a neurologist's job to figure out whether it's a functional neurological disorder or something else, other neurological conditions going on. But reality is usually, or most of the times, if you can get to see a neurologist to confirm the diagnosis, great. But more commonly speaking, you would go to see a primary care provider or um, pediatrician and then go to ER times probably 20, right? And then go see a neurologist in the ER or hospital settings for whatever reasons. If they can have an on-call doctor, that would be great. Otherwise, there's an internist hospital, so whatever, whatever other providers, right? In the hospital setting. And then you go see a neurologist for a second opinion, and maybe that would be times 20 more other doctors to get the 20 or 30 different second opinions because you are having either hard time understanding what it is or the doctor who gave you the diagnosis is super dismissive or not really explaining what it is. So you're, for whatever reasons, you're not satisfied with that diagnosis, which is also ironically commonly seen with families who get this diagnosis of FND. I used to work in hospital settings. I mean, so many different hospital settings, but I used to work with cancer patients. That was my specialty, both children, pediatric, and then also adult. I've never had this experience. Well, I shouldn't say never. I rarely had this experience of patients getting a diagnosis of cancer and they are not believing it and going to 20, 30, 40 different doctors or however many visits to ER just because a family has a hard time believing it. I have seen some cases of cancer being diagnosed for different reasons, but far less likely and mostly because you can see on the scan, biopsy, right? And all these tests, blood work and everything else all points to concrete 
I guess, visible evidence of something is not right. And so when you go see an oncologist, a cancer doctor, and they give you the diagnosis of here's a cancer, then parents and families are a lot more into, oh my gosh, we have to solve this problem right away, right? Because yes, it is a life-threatening illness. Speaking of life-threatening illness, FND is not considered a life-threatening illness, meaning it's not a medical emergency. You're not going to die from it, right? Just because you have an FND, although you could have a secondary injury by falling and hitting your head, you know, stuff like that. But FND itself, just because you have it doesn't necessarily mean, I guess it doesn't mean that you're going to die from it. However, if you don't do anything about it, there are some serious consequences. So let's keep going. Step two who treats FND? Well, it really depends on who is out there, what kind of resources are available, and who can you see first. But in giant categories, I would say psychology, physiotherapy or physical therapist, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and psychiatry. So those are the kind of five typical treatment providers. Neurologist is not necessarily one of them because neurologist's job is to give you a diagnosis. They're not the ones to actually treat because there is no single medication or medical procedures that you can do to resolve or cure or fix FND, at least at this time. And I don't even know if there will be because the mechanism of FND is really the communication network problem. So I don't think there is any one single bullet medication that is going to fix it because it's a lot more complex than that. So psychology, let's talk briefly about it. I'm a health psychologist, so I know a lot more about psychology treatment than any other providers. However, let me go through one by one, sort of briefly overview. So psychologist's job is to provide both bottom up and then top down approach to really resolve FND, especially for teens. And then spe speaking of working with teens, the school support, coordination of care with other providers, and educating the parents about what they can do to actually help the child get better from FND. So all of these things are the typical work or I guess typical job duty of pediatric health psychologists. Now there are so many types of psychologists. Is this kind of treatment done by a, let's say, Forensic psychologist, highly unlikely. Could it be done by anxiety specialists? Maybe, but highly unlikely because anxiety specialist therapists are not necessarily trained to work on these health conditions, let alone work with medical teams and other providers and things like that. I just want to make sure that I'm not saying to dis be dismissive of these other therapists, but it's just a different kinds of training. And most pediatric health psychologists are, I guess, breathing and living in the hospital settings like myself. And I used to work in hospital settings and I, I don't for many different reasons, but that's just another story. But because of the nature of their training and then how they are housed in this medical system, you wouldn't necessarily see pediatric health psychologists walking around like every block, like a Starbucks. You know what I mean? However, there are resources out there. So I do have a list of providers on in my description box below, but that is essentially what the psychologist can do to support you and your family kind of all together. That's why psychologist's job is so critical, not because FND is this mental health problem or it's a stress or anxiety or trauma kind of thing, Yes, that could be part of the pictures, but it's not just that. And speaking of kind of going back to what is FND, FND is a biological, psychological, and social phenomenon. So it's not just one thing that is causing the problem. Now back to who treats physiotherapy or physical therapists. Again, not everybody needs to see a physical therapist, but a lot of patients do benefit from seeing a physical therapist depending on the condition and the type of symptoms that your child is experiencing. So the first thing that you want to ask is again, neurologist who is familiar with the FND about what kind of treatment options are out there. However, what PT can do is anything to do with the movement, functional seizures, paralysis, the gait issues, and things like that. In occupational therapy, 
along with the physical therapy, can also help out with the fine motor. Now you're having a hard time moving your hand or um, having this daily functioning uh, activities, then occupational therapy would be an excellent addition to your treatment option. And then speech therapy for any speech or swallowing difficulties. But again, you know, sometimes the speech therapist can also help with the cognitive therapy as long as they are used to and then trained on something called cog rehab, which is cognitive rehabilitation. So again, what kind of training training these providers are having really kind of dictate who you need to work with and also what kind of symptoms that your child is having. Now back to the fifth category of treatment options, which is a psychiatry. Again, do, does your child need psychiatry service all the time? Yes and no, it depends. However, what psychiatry can do is the medication management. And once again, there isn't any single medication that would cure FND, but some teens will take medication to help with other symptoms they're having. For example, anxiety, panic attacks, sleep issues, and having a hard time focusing and brain fog and things like that. Again, they're not necessarily to cure FND, but to augment the symptoms that they're experiencing. So again, psychology, physiotherapy or physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and then psychiatry. All right. So let's talk about the diagnosis and the prognosis. Prognosis is basically like this fancy name for will your teen with FND ever get better? Or is it something that you have to live with for the rest of your child's life because it's now a permanent thing? Well, I have a good news and bad news. The good news is, generally speaking, the prognosis for FND for teens is very, very good. And when I say very, very good is it's like literally close to 90%, if not more, depending on who you ask, of completely resolving FND. For these teens. That is a possibility. I have worked with so many teens with FND and as long as they take the right approach and then they actually do the work, they all get better. They all get better. Okay. Again, so there are some variations to it. First of all, as I mentioned earlier, you have to take the right approach. And if you don't know what the right approach is, go to my website and check out the different things and information out or on my channel. And there are so many different videos about why this is happening and what it is and how you can get better and all that kind of stuff. So right approach is one thing. The other thing is that you have to start this treatment or healing journey as soon as possible. There is no reason for you to wait and drag to start the treatment because the longer you wait to start the treatment or healing journey, the chances of you and your child getting better from FND sort of becomes lower and lower and lower. I wouldn't necessarily say it's going to be impossible, but there is a way to make it impossible to get better, which I'm going to get to it. But essentially, as soon as you get the diagnosis, get the treatment right away, and then you get better. And that being said, Unfortunately, the average time to get to the diagnosis and then treatment really varies, right? I have seen as short as somebody getting diagnosed within like three weeks from the time that they started having symptoms. And so that's one end of the spectrum to the other side of the spectrum, which is like has taken them years, like over 10 years to get to the diagnosis because they have been having this condition for so long and they were sort of meandering, you know, with different, um, maze and dead end approach and knowledge and they thought it was epilepsy they thought it was this they thought it was that and then finally got to the fnd diagnosis so sometimes it can happen i have seen both sides of stories that even though it has taken them so long for them to get the diagnosis as soon as they start the treatment and the right approach then these kids do get better. Or I have seen the opposite end of the spectrum that they just started having a symptoms within a month of seeing me and it's taking them years, you know, to get better. Well, for these kind of situations, there are usually something else going on. Like for example, I had a teen who had this sudden onset of FND symptoms. However, what was happening, it was that this individual had a chronic pain for over 10 years. And so again, as I mentioned, chronic pain is closely related to FND. So even though FND itself was like short term, 
there were so many things that was going on that we had to deal with those things, right? So then the recovery journey became a lot longer than anticipated. Or I also had another individual who just got diagnosed with FND within the month, you know, from starting the symptom, and then they got better within three weeks of working together. So again, it really varies, but as long as they take the right approach and parents are also on board with this diagnosis and working together as a team, to get better with full commitment, then yes, I have seen so many great cases, regardless of how long they have been struggling with this condition of FND. But it really starts with accepting the diagnosis and getting the right uh, diagnosis to begin with, right? So on the other hand, what would happen? What would happen if you don't do anything to treat this condition? which again, I have seen so many cases as well, which is unfortunate. And as I mentioned earlier, FND is not necessarily a life-threatening disease like cancer. Like if you don't do anything, you're like, you're guaranteed to die, you know, kind of thing, right? It's not that. However, it's just as debilitating and disabling. Can you imagine your child is right now having here and there functional seizures, let's just say. And every time your child has an episode, your child needs to be taken to home from school or wherever they're at. Now, two years later, because you're like, well, yeah, okay, it's really hard and I'm really worried about my child, but we can't really find the provider in our local area or who can see with our insurance and for whatever, whatever reasons, we're not gonna be doing much of anything unless we're just praying for this perfect provider to come to our life, you know, kind of thing, right? Can you imagine two years from now, fast forward, cause I've seen a lot of different scenarios. Now this child is, let's just say, senior in high school and barely able to walk and maybe on a wheelchair almost full time, having a hard time talking or swallowing or constantly in a bad mood and just stay in the room all day, every day. What kind of life is that? And really the question is, can you afford to have that kind of life? And I also had very unfortunate incident that while the parents were sort of kind of worried and trying to do something, but not really doing anything for whatever reasons, in the meantime, the child continues to deteriorate and the mood is now into like a dumpster and super, super depressed to the point of attempting suicide, for example. As I mentioned, I've seen so many different cases And again, just out of respect, FND, again, is not necessarily a life-threatening disease, but really, if you think about it, FND has been holding your child captive because your child does not have any life and completely disabled. Now, how could you afford to have your child not have a life at all, right? So... I don't mean to scare you or anything, but it's really hard for people to see what would happen. You know, like all these doctors are saying it's not medical emergency, so we don't even need to call 911 and we just need to continue to send my child to school and, you know, stuff like that, right? So like what else do they need to do to take it serious? Well, it's that serious disability and completely not having life. And speaking of which, when I say there is a possibility that you could live like this for the rest of your life or your child's life, again, it is possible. It has more to do with the uh, lack of information and also the mindset. And mostly it's not necessarily their fault, but many doctors are still saying, oh yeah, now FND is chronic and it's a permanent thing. So you have to learn to live with it, right? And if you and your child are super rule following and just following what these doctors are saying, then you're just believing, oh, it is what it is. And then now we have to learn to live with it. Then oddly speaking, FND is going to stay in your child's life for the rest of their life. And this is a kind of situations where you would be on wheelchair 100% of the time, on disability, can't work, can't go to school, forget life and forget any going to college or anything like that, forget that 
forget the relationship. And now you're living with a service dog that you are basically imprinting. There's nothing wrong with the service dog, but essentially for having this kind of assistive devices is basically imprinting to the idea in your child's brain. This is who I am. This is how I'm going to live with. Speaking of assisted device, I'm not saying get rid of everything altogether from day one kind of thing. You have to titrate it, meaning you have to baby step, start getting rid of using those things if you want to get better and resolve the FND. Now, it's your choice whether you want to be glued to FND and then live your life like that for the rest of your life, or you know what? I am going to fight for my life because I have every right to deserve so much more than what I am getting right now. And this is not the life I dreamt of. This is not the healthy and happy life that I want for my child. Then you have to fight for it because the solution is out there. Now, really, it starts with A, understanding what it is that you're dealing with. And then B, you are aware the solution is out there. And speaking of solutions, you have to work with teen FND specialists. FND is a special problem that requires a specialist to work with. And I have a video talking about how to find this specialist, but really this is the step one of the whole healing journey. A, know what you're dealing with, like what is a diagnosis, and then know that there is a solution out there. So really this is a time for you to maybe roll up your sleeves and really get to the bottom of this and fight for it. Now, I want to know how many people are actually diagnosed with FND and then what were you told by doctors about this condition? Because I really want to know. So leave a comment below. And if you want to know more about what FND is, how you can help and what to do with school and what to say to providers and things like that, watch all of my videos on this channel and get educated as much as possible at your own time. Now, thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next video.